Sometimes the troops need to be rallied. Sometimes people get discouraged. Sometimes people don't think they have what it takes to go forward another day or another step. And somebody needs to come up and rally them up to give them the courage, to give them the motivation to go forward with life. Oftentimes, when someone in the Bible was doing that, they would often go back and tell a story. Because story is the power to rally us on to new heights. Remember the Alamo, right? That is a story that would would flock memories of all those soldiers and what happened to us at the Alamo, and we're not going to let that happen again. So it was a rallying cry. In the athletic field, when the Boston Red Sox came back from an 0-3 deficit and ended up beating the Yankees in that series, how many other teams that were down 0-3 do you think heard the story of the Boston Red Sox? We know someone's been able to do this as a rallying cry to carry forward. Well, what we have in God's book is we have a lot of stories that should rally us on to several different things. We're going to talk about how God uses story as a way to rally us to know our value. When God wanted the children of Israel to know how valuable they were to him, he would remind them of a story. How the power of story is the power to rally people to be courageous. When they want to give up, when they want to fall, when they want to be cowards, Moses would tell them, don't remember the story. It is the rally cry to obey. It is really the foundation of obedience, the story was. And obedience, trying to tell someone or teach someone to be obedient, absent of the story, is worthless. It would have been, it was in the Old Testament, it is today. There has to be that story to hold on to. If it's not for the story, why do I why should I obey that God? It's the story that gives us the glue, gives us the courage to do what God tells us to do. And then story is the power to rally us on to faithful living. And that's key. Because one of the things that God has always required of His people, He's always always required His people to persevere. Right? He's always required faith, no doubt, Old and New Testament. He's always required obedience. You can't read the stories without coming up with that conclusion. But He's always required us to persevere, to keep on keeping on. Be faithful until death and you will receive the crown of life. Well, story is that shot in the arm sometimes as we're trying to go about and we want to give up, we want to quit. We need to be reminded of the story to live faithfully. There are people who have, who have lived faithfully. Let me share this story with you to help you live faithfully. Let me share this story with you to help you live faithfully. And that's what God does. What are the goals that we're trying to accomplish? We learn lessons as we go and we read these verses without question. And those are important lessons for us to learn. But I want to maybe help you see something in a way that maybe you haven't before. And that is the power that God has in using these stories for a purpose. Because we can do that too. If God does it, remember we talked about he knows how we tick, right? He made us. He knows how we think. He knows that stories are valuable to us. We use this illustration on Sunday morning that sometimes kids bring the exact same storybook to you night after night after night and say, read this story, read this story, read this story, and you read the same story to them. Joel was telling me that one of his grandkids, Kenny's youngest, I believe, would always jump up in his lap and say, tell me a story, tell me a story, tell me a story, or read me a story. You guys are familiar with that. I know my dad used to tell bear stories to our, to our kids when they were smaller. We're designed to respond to stories. That's why God uses them. And not only is that why God uses them, so much of what is in the Bible, He makes happen that way, I think, for the sake of the story. To make it a big story. Because the bigger the story, the more likely you are to tell it, right? Why would 300 men go against 135,000 men? And the torches, right? And the torches and the blowing the trumpet 
and everybody down there starts killing them. That's just an awesome story. You have to tell that story. Or marching around the walls. Why in the world would you do that? This isn't some great military strategy. I think it's in part because it's a story to tell. You never believe what God had us do. We marched once a day, we'd march, and we would seventh day, and all the walls fell down. We were able to charge up, we took over the city. So if you're reading these stories, why did God do that? Well, he may have done part of these things just so his people would have a story to tell. And the world would have a story to tell. I think that's why he did the, did the Egyptian exodus the way that he did. We talked about that a little bit, right? He could have done it any way he wanted to. But this is a story that shows he is God. No one else. It shows he's doing this. No one else is doing this. So that he gets all glory. He gets all credit. He said, so that my name may be glorified in all the earth. That's why I'm doing it this way. And at the end of the day, it had that effect. We, we noted that. I want to bring you back to Exodus chapter 10 as we start our first point. God used stories so that the, his people would know their value. There's not going to be answers on the board behind me. Okay? So you're going to have to really pay attention. And as I say it, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the answer, and you write it down. If you, if you miss one, just come up to me afterwards. I have all the answers here, so we, we should be fine. We talked about the Exodus. Remember those intended audiences of the Exodus? Why God was doing what he was doing the way that he was doing it? He said, Pharaoh, I want you to know who I am. Because Pharaoh asked the question, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? I do not know the Lord. I will not let the people go. So he wanted Pharaoh to know. He wanted the Egyptians to know who he was. He wanted the Canaanites to know who he was because him, them knowing that story was going to cause them to be afraid. And he wanted all the world to know, I didn't bring in this verse. I was saving it for tonight. He did that also for his own people. His own people needed that story. And let's look at that verse in Exodus chapter 10 and verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine before him, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your son's son the mighty things I have done in Egypt, and by my signs which I have done among them, that they may know that I am the Lord. Moses, I'm giving you a story to tell to your children and your grandchildren. And this story of the hail, the story of the flies, the story of the frogs, and eventually the story of the firstborn dying, I'm giving you this, Moses, so you can tell that to your children and you can tell that to your grandchildren so that your children your grandchildren will know that I am the Lord. He uses this story with his people often. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Moses is trying to give them encouragement as they're going to eventually go into the promised land. But he wants them to know, you're a great nation. You're special. And he uses that story of the Exodus to prove to them that they're special. For what great nation is there that God is so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him, and what great nation is there that has set statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law that I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself. Lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, lest you depart from your heart all the days of your life and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Now notice also verse 9, we just read verse 9. I want to go back and emphasize something in there lest you forget the things your eyes have seen. He's talking to people who saw the exodus. He's talking to people who saw all the plagues. Don't forget what you saw. How many of you forget things on occasion? How many of you guys forget a lot of stuff? I forget stuff all the time. All right? We have bad memories. And God knows that about us. Remember, God knows what, how we tick. He knows we have bad memories. We're going to talk about that later on in the week, about how it's the power to remind us. But he knows, he goes, don't forget what you saw. Just to talk about, as a nation, how bad of memory we have is, we've only been in existence for over 200 years, but even our founding is in question, and all the things that went on with our founding. We have to have good memories. The way to have good memories is to tell a story. I bet you there are, are things that have happened in your life that you may not actually remember, but you remember them because you've told that story enough times. That if you had not told that story so many times, you would have forgotten that event. 
You, you probably have experienced that. You have a friend that you haven't seen in a long time, and you have forgotten about a certain event that happened in your life, and they come and they, they meet you and they say, hey, do you remember the time we did this, this, and this, and this? And you what? And they, they give you a few more details, and they start telling you the story. And Oh, now that's coming back to me. And then you start talking about it a little bit more, and you remember that story. Because if we don't continually tell the story and continually remind ourselves of those stories, we forget them. How much more true is that of Bible things? If we don't constantly remind ourselves of the great stories in here, we tend to forget them. But let's go ahead and look at verse 10. Especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. I think we talked about that here. I think I talked about that with you here, about how all the children of Israel on one day, in Exodus chapter 20, they all gathered to the Mount Sinai, and God let all of them hear his voice. Sometimes people think Moses just heard him. Or sometimes people think nobody heard him. God just wrote it on some tablets and gave it to Moses and Moses read it. All of them heard God's voice. He says, don't forget that day. Don't forget that story. Tell that story to your children and your grandchildrens. Grandchildrens. <laughs> yeah, tell them to your grandchildrens too. But one of the things he's talking about here is that Israelites are described as being near to God. The Israelites could call on him whenever they wanted. Well, what was the foundation of that very special relationship? He goes, it's not because you're great. It's because I've loved you. It is because of the story of what happened at Mount Sinai as well as what happened in the Exodus. They, how did they know they were special? They knew they were special not only because God told them, but because God treated them in a special way. He brought them out of Egyptian bondage. You want to know how special you are? Go back. I redeemed you out of bondage. I bought you. I, I came and delivered you. That's my proof. We all recognize that. If, if, if somebody tells you they love you all the time, but they never do anything to show you they love you? How important are those words? Don't they lose their meaning? Well, God says, I, I sh I'm telling you I love you, but I've showed it to you. And so this is the story they go back to. I redeemed you from the land of Egypt. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. He says, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Look at that. I mean, isn't that, doesn't that make you feel good if you're the Israelites? God has chosen you to be the most special people on the entire earth. Well, what's going to be his evidence for that? The Lord did not set his love on you nor chose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all the people. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage and from the house, the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now he goes back to an event, a very important event, and that is the promise he made to Abraham. That's part of it. That's a, that's a huge part of it. I was going to keep that oath that I made to Abraham. But as far further proof that they were his special treasure, they were a special treasure to him, he said, I redeemed you from the land of Egypt. You see how important that story was? I told you it was the Old Testament story. So he wants to prove to them. He wants to show them. He wants to remind them how special they are. He always goes back to that story. I bought you. I redeemed you. I brought you out of Egypt. And they would know that story. For generation after generation after generation after generation, they knew that story. And we'll talk about how they remembered that story, the mechanism God put in place for that a little bit later on this week. But they knew that story. And that would bring back those feelings. We are special. God does love us because of that story. Well, it's also the power to be courageous. Moses is telling them that they're about to go into the land of Canaan. And they might get scared. You think, you think any of the Israelites would have gotten scared going to the land of Canaan? We know they did the first time, right? 
They were so afraid of going in, they didn't go in. The story didn't have the effect that it should have had. It only had the effect it should have had on two people, right? Which, which I guess is a, is a point worth making here for just, just a second. The story doesn't work the same on all people. We talked about the parable of the soils the other day, right? You can tell the same stories to a whole group of people, and it's only going to affect certain ones. The only one that had the effect, Joshua and Caleb, right? The rest of them had experienced the story. The rest of them had been encouraged to remember the story, but they didn't have the courage necessary. It was only Joshua and Caleb. But let's look at what Moses says here in Deuteronomy 37 and verse 17. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? So he's saying, if you go to the land, you get right on the border, the cusp of taking the land, and you happen to say to yourself, we can't do this. The people are greater than I. Moses has the solution. And I, I imagine you already know what the solution is. It's remember the story. You shall not be afraid of them, verse 18, but you shall remember well what the Lord your God did to Pharaoh and to all Egypt. The great trials which your eyes saw, the signs and the wonders, the mighty hand and the outstretched arm by which the Lord your God brought you out. So shall the Lord your God do to all the peoples of whom you are afraid. Moreover, the Lord your God will send the hornet among them until those who are left who hide themselves from you are destroyed. You shall not be terrified of them, for the Lord your God, the great and awesome God, is among you. And the Lord your God will drive out these nations before you little by little. You will be unable to destroy them at once, lest the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. But the Lord your God will deliver you them over to you. You shall inflict defeat upon them until they are destroyed. And he will deliver their kings into your hand and you will destroy their name from under heaven. No one shall be able to stand against you until you have destroyed them. You shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is in them, nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it, for it is an abomination to the Lord your God. Nor shall you bring an abomination to your house, lest you be doomed to destruction like it. You shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is a cursed thing. But you notice what Moses did there. He goes, you're going to be afraid. When you are afraid, he says, to remember what God did to Pharaoh in Egypt. And that would give them courage when they go in to dispossess the Canaanites, kick them out of the land. And if you go to the story of the 12 spies, isn't that apparent? That some of them forgot that story? At least maybe mentally they, they knew it, but it, they didn't take courage in it. And the two men did. Uh, Joshua and Caleb are amazing because they remember the story. They remember what God did in Egypt. And they're able to stand, stand up and say, we will eat them for lunch. They will be our lunch because they remember that story. That's the difference. The story, remembering the story is the difference between being courageous and being less than courageous, or being scared to death. So we have to remember the stories. The stories would keep them from being afraid. It would keep them from being fearful. That's what Moses says. If you remember the story, you won't be afraid. If you remember the story, you won't be fearful. How true is that? If they remember what God does, David used that as a rallying cry for himself, didn't he? When he goes up before and, and to battle, battle Goliath, what in his past does he use as a rallying cry? The lion and the bear, right? He remembered the lion and the bear. And because he remembered that God delivered him in the lion and the bear, he remembered that story that he could say, this uncircumcised Philistine is nothing for me. And he could be a trash talker. He could say, I'm going to feed you to the birds of the air. Because he knew who God was. He remembered the story from when he killed the lion and the bear. Stories give people courage. And this book is full of stories that should give each and every one of us courage. And that's why they're so fascinating to read. And that's why they are a must for all of us to know. 
and to be familiar with and to be able to call up in our minds just like that. So not only is story the power to get us to be in a situation where we know our value and that we're courageous, story is also the power to encourage us to obey. And that's key. Can you please God if you don't obey him? We talk about the verses, right? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father that is in heaven. That's a powerful verse. That is a powerful statement. But how many stories are there in God's word that show that over and over and over again in very, very powerful ways? Which helps you to remember that more? I'd have to say sometimes the stories have a better impact on me because I'm wired for story as God has created us. Back in Deuteronomy 37, verse 12. Then it shall come to pass, because you listen to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord your God will keep the covenant and the mercy which he swore to your fathers. Verse 13. And he will love you and he will bless you and he will multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of the land, your grain and your new wine, your oil, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flock in the land of which he swore to your fathers to give you. Now, let's just stop here for a second. This is an amazing passage. They're get, I was reading this again today and I was like, this is, this is unbelievable. The promise that God made to them, if they obey how this would be, almost, it almost goes back to a Garden of Eden type of an environment. See, all, a lot of those consequences that happen because of sin, I am going to step in and I'm not going to make you face those consequences. I'm going to make your, your produce grow a lot more than normal because I'm going to be with you. Let's continue reading it as we, as we go. Verse 14. You shall be blessed above all peoples. There shall not be a male or female barren among you or among your livestock. If they had kept the commandments, if they had obeyed God, I believe Hannah wouldn't have had to pray the prayer for Samuel. Because God says, hey, if you obey me, no one's going to be barren. No, now your livestock's not going to be barren. No person is going to be barren. And the Lord will take away from you sickness that, and will afflict you with none of the terrible diseases of Egypt which you have known, but will lay them on those who hate you. Also you shall destroy all the peoples from the Lord your God delivers over to you. Your eyes shall not have pity on them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that will be a snare to you. In the context where Moses is reminding them of the Egyptian story, he told them that if they would listen to keep and do what the Lord commanded that he would bless them with incredible blessings. It's similar to what he does with Jeroboam. He takes the kingdom away from Solomon's family. He gives ten tribes to Jeroboam. What does he tell Jeroboam? If you obey me, if you do what, you're going to have an heir to sit on the throne of Israel just like David has an heir to sit on the throne of Judah. And unfortunately, he immediately disobeyed. But God makes this promise in the context of the story of the Egyptians. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 1. Therefore you shall love the Lord your God and keep his charge, his statutes, his judgments, and his commandments always. Know today, who's he speaking to? I do not speak with your children who have not known, who have not seen the chastening of the Lord your God. So he's talking to eyewitnesses, right? Right? They have not seen his greatness and his mighty hand and his outstretched arm, his signs and his acts which he did in the midst of Egypt to Pharaoh king of Egypt and to all his land, what he did to the army of Egypt, to their horses and their chariots, how he made the waters of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued you, and how the Lord has destroyed them to this day, what he did for you in the wilderness until you came to this place, and what he did to Dathan and Abram the sons of Eliab, of, uh, the son of Reuben, how the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up, their household, their tents, and all the substance that was in their possession in the midst of all Israel. But your eyes have seen every great act of the Lord which he did. Therefore you shall keep every commandment which I command you today, that you may be strong and go into possess the land which you cross over to possess. 
and that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give your fathers to them and their descendants a land flowing with milk and honey. Moses appealed to the story of Egypt to rally the people to keep all my statutes, all my judgments, and all my commands. If you saw what happened to the Egyptians who did not, don't you think you would be motivated to keep all the commands of God? And then he throws in there the warning of the rebellion there that happened. Remember what happened to him? Now, the power to warn is something we'll talk about later. But remember what happened to him? God's warning. Hey, the earth swallowed them up because they didn't obey. They were rebellious. Remember that? It's a story that they could go back to. They could think about and say, oh, that's what happens when you don't obey God. Bad things happen when you don't obey God. Good things happen when you obey God. Moses was talking to people who actually live through the stories. And in this text, you go back to our second point. He takes the time to give them courage to enter the promised land. He says there, I command you today that you may be strong. He's telling them the story so they can be strong. They could be courageous as they were getting ready to go into the promised land. It's the power to motivate us to obey it is also the power for us to motivate us to faithful living you ever get discouraged we all get discouraged don't we well, I just want to throw in the towel sometimes what's the point God in his infinite wisdom uses story to try to tell you don't give up. He can tell it to you but he always reminds you there are people who didn't give up. There are, isn't that what Hebrews chapter 11 is all about? God put that chapter there to motivate us to faithful living because other people have been able to do it successfully. Let's start in chapter 12 though. Chapter 12 and verse 1. After he goes through all those people who had done all these great things, he says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher, finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. The stories in Hebrews chapter 11 were put there by God to motivate us to lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares us and to run with endurance the race that is set before us. God, if you're, going to rem if you're going to make it through this life as a faithful Christian, I'm convinced of this, you will not do it apart from the stories in the Bible. You will not do it apart from the story in the Bible, and you will not do it apart from the stories of the Bible, because you can't self-discipline your way to heaven. Now, you can't get there without self-discipline. But you can't self, you can't, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do right, I'm going 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 to do right, and you just can't will it to be the case. God, you're not wired that way. You're wired by God to look at stories and know that other people have done it, and if Bill can do it, I can do it. If Moses can do it, I can do it. If other people have pleased God, and he has been happy with them, and he welcomes them in, who had to endure a lot more than I will ever have to endure, surely I can do it. And as you read chapter 11, I think, it, I mean, you picture, and I don't know who mentioned this to me, I'm sure lots of people have, have, have mentioned this, and maybe I've even thought about doing this. If you could go into your house, if you get some, uh, those, those fat heads, you know those fat heads you can put on the wall? If you could get some, Bible character fatheads. And you can get a Moses. And you can get a Noah. And you can get an Abraham. 
and you can get a Daniel, and you can get Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and you can get all of those great people all around your house or your kids' bedrooms. And you can always look to them and say, look, we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. We can do this. We can do this. Look at all these people who have done this. And, and, and although we probably won't do that, but isn't that what he's doing in Hebrews chapter 11? And as parents and as Christians, shouldn't that be what we continue to do with one another? You can do this because they did it. Let's look at a few of them that he mentions there in Hebrews chapter 11. The story, did, I, did I give you this answer? The story of Jesus to help us live a faithful life? Without question, and we'll get back to that here at the end. Look, look, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7. By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. See, Noah stood in contrast to the entire world, and he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. How many of you feel outnumbered by the world? We all feel outnumbered, don't we? We are outnumbered by the world. Do you ever get discouraged by that? Oh, man, all the world, they've forgotten about God, and they're so immoral. And look at how the state of the world that we're in, and there's bombings, and there's murders, and there's people who... The abortion trial that is going on in Philadelphia right now, it is just sickening as you read those details. Uh, and you have a tendency... I just want to throw my arms up and, Lord, take me now. I'm not going to make it much longer. I mean, the world's going to go, and I just can't continue living on as bad as this world is. And some of you probably feel sorry for your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren that they're living in such a corrupt society and that they will continue to live in such a corrupt society. What a great story we have in Noah. What if you were the only one? You realize how many more blessings we have over Noah? I think he had 94 here on Sunday. 94 here on Sunday. You're not alone, are you? You might feel like you're alone sometimes. Like Elijah felt like he was alone. And God had to remind him, hey, there are more. You're not the only one. But what if there were no more? What if you and your family were it? You were the only righteous people on the entire earth and you didn't have the Lopez's to look at or the Beauvais to look at or any other family that is here as an example of people who are enduring through these trials. You could look at the example of Noah. You could look at that story and say, wow, he did it when no one else would do it. And he saved his family. Brothers and sisters, the story of Noah should give us courage that we can save our family even in a wicked generation. If Noah can do it, with God's help, we can do it. And we have more than God's help. We have help from other Christians. God put that story there. It's therefore, since you are surrounded by Noah, lay aside the sin which so easily ensnares you and run with endurance the race that is set before you. Ultimately looking to Jesus, the author and finisher. Finisher. I can't say that. Finisher? What am I doing? Finisher of our faith. All right, let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, by Isaac your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him even from the dead from which he received him in a figurative sense. See, the story of Abraham's faith, it allowed him to make the ultimate sacrifice of his child. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Did Abraham please God? Can you please God? You won't be asked to do that. In that sense, right? You won't be asked to go up in a mountain and sacrifice your son. Anything God throws your way, you should be able to do through faith. Abraham's a good example of that. 
story. See how important they are? God knows how we're wired. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempted to do so were drowned. Now, how many life situations should Moses encourage us to get through? How many times can we look at that story and say, look what Moses did with his faith. I can do it too. That's why the story is there. Moses' faith enabled him to have the proper perspective on life. I would rather suffer with the people of God than enjoy all the money in the world. Moses' parents hit him. What did it say? It said it both of Moses' folks and it said it of Moses. They were not afraid of the king. You think if our government ever decides that it's wrong to preach against sinful things, that we're going to need to go back to these stories, and we're going to need to draw some courage from this? Look, uh, even if the law is passed saying you can't preach against this, or you can't preach in favor of this, you can't preach against abortion, you cannot preach against homosexuality, you can't preach against all this, we're going to go back to these verses. We're going to go back to the life of Moses, and we're going to say, look, there's some people, his parents and himself, who stood up to Pharaoh. They weren't afraid of Pharaoh because they knew who God was. You think you're going to go to the story of Peter and John when they're standing before the very men who just put Jesus to death? And they say, we must obey God rather than men. Those stories are going to prove valuable if that ever happens to us. Please remember those stories if things like that happen to us. In the Old Testament, it was the story of the Red Sea crossing that was the basis for almost everything. God used that story to remind them of their value. God used that story to tell them to be courageous. Why are you going to be fearful of the, of the enemies when you know what God did to the Egyptians? And those who remember the story, they weren't. He used that story to say, look, remember what happened in Egypt. You should keep every commandment I give you. It was the reminder to obey. And he used that story to get them to live faithfully as God has given us the other stories to get us to live faithfully. Now, I want to just share another couple thoughts with you. Take yourself out of the Egyptians' place or out of the Israelites' place for a second. Don't have to go back to the Red Sea crossing to know how valuable you are, to know how important you are. most quoted verse in the Bible for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son do you realize that's how valuable you are the story of the cross the story of the life of Jesus should tell you every single day I'm important to him I'm valuable to him John 15 and verse 13 says Greater love hath no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. Jesus died for you. God did what Abraham didn't have to go through with. 
if that's not evidence that he loves us and that we're special to him, there's not a story that anyone could write to tell us, to show us our value. The life of God's Son. The story of Jesus is also a story of courage. The story of Jesus is there for us when it comes to this idea of obedience. How can I not obey God? How can I not obey His Son when they were willing to give the life of Jesus for me? See how motivating that is? When, when God gives me commands and instructions, which I know are for my good anyway, and He says, you do this. He doesn't do that in a vacuum. He doesn't give us those commands in a vacuum. He gives them to us wrapped in the story of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's why they're so powerful. That's our motivation for doing what God tells us to do is because we have a story that goes behind it that is the most powerful story ever. It has changed the world. And it has changed you. And it has changed me. And it continues to do that. And I hope by looking at that story of Jesus and some of these other examples and stories we've looked at today, that we will be motivated to live faithfully until the day that we die so that one day our story will end with a well done, good and faithful servant. Are you looking forward to that part of it? That's part of our story. That's part of our future if we hold fast to the story of the cross. Our future is that God is going to introduce us to his father, our father, and say, this is Bill White. He's one of our servants. He gets to come in. That's going to be an awesome day. It's that day, that future story that we all look forward to. If you have never submitted your life to that great God who laid his life down for you, you need to do that. And if you don't know what you need to do to do that, we'll be glad to tell you. And like I said last night, what we're going to do is we're going to share a couple stories with you. It's plain and simple. We're not going to make it up. We're not going to tell you to do anything that's not in here. We're going to tell you what they did in the New Testament time. And we're going to say, that's what I did. When I found out that's what I needed to do, that's what I did. That's what I encourage you to do. If you are a Christian and you're not living right and it's of a public nature, Bill or one of the men here can take any kind of a public confession. We can pray for you to get you back on that track so that the story of your life is a story that will eventually lead you to your father. If we can help you in any way, please come as we stand and sing. I am resolved to the world, the